So here we're given the sides of this triangle, and uh, we want angle C, B, A. Now, as I've said previously, if we're looking for an angle, just call it capital A. It's the easiest approach. So that means that the side opposite capital A is small a. The other two sides are small b and small c. And of course, it doesn't matter which one you call small b and which one you call small c. So with this convention here for, for um, calling the angle we're looking for capital A, we just have to use this version of the cosine rule. So you can use this version all of the time just to save con getting confused. And uh, we want to re rearrange this to find cos of A. And uh, next we just plug in for the three sides A, B and C and work this out. So we get inverse cos of this number and that's the angle that we're looking for. So we temporarily call it A. We always call it a missing object, either capital A for an angle or small a for a side if we're looking for a side. But of course um, this angle here is uh, C, B, A where A is this corner. Now to get the area of this triangle, we use the fact that we have two sides and the angle in between the two sides. So we use the formula half the product of the two sides times the sine of the angle in between the two sides. So that's the easiest way to remember this formula. You can forget about this half a b sine c business if you like. Um, small a and small b refer to two sides. Well, they happen to be small b and small c here, but you could relabel them, of course. And then capital C would be the angle in between. So it's just best to rem remember this in words. Half the product of the sides times the sine of the angle in between those two sides. So to the nearest integer, we get 7,653 meters squared. Now you could also use this formula here. S is half the perimeter of the triangle. So we add up the three sides and divide by two. So you see we get 202 and we have to take S, which is half the perimeter, and subtract each of the three sides, 202 minus 134, 202 minus 150, and 202 minus 120. So you see we don't have to use any, any angle here, but we need all three sides for this formula. A vertical mass DE is fixed at the circumcenter D of the triangle. So recall that the circumcenter of a triangle is the, is the center of a circle that can be drawn through the three corners of the triangle. So that means the distance of D to B, D to C and D to A must be radii of that circumcircle. Okay, if we want to draw a circle through the three corners. So D must be equidistant from those three points. We have three cables, EA, EB and EC, holding the mast in place. Notice that we have three right angle triangles. Here's one, here's another, and here's a third. That's because the mast is vertical. So the mast is perpendicular to any line in this triangle. So the, the three red lines are in the plane of the triangle. Okay, so our mast is perpendicular to them. Um, now, these three right angle triangles are actually congruent. Okay, we have, well, the red line is the same in all three of them. And of course, the mast is common to all three triangles. And the angle in between the mast and each red line is the same. So it's a case of side angle side for each of those three right angle triangles. Okay, we have um, in each triangle two sides and the angle in between is the same. So as a consequence, um, the remaining side in each of the three triangles must be equal. Okay, if the three tri triangles are congruent. So this side must equal this, this. These three blue lines are the same. Now to prove this identity, notice that 2A can be written as A plus A. So we want to get the cos of the sum of these two angles. Well, here we have an identity for the cos of the sum of two angles. So we just replace B with A. So we get uh, cos A times cos A. Well, that can be written cos squared A. Sine A multiplied by itself is written sine squared A. 
The diagram shows part of a circular end of a running track with three running lanes shown. The centre of each of the circular boundaries of the lanes is at O. Kate runs in the middle of lane 1 um, from point A to point B. Helen runs in the middle of lane 2 from point C to point D. And we're given that Helen runs 3 metres further than Kate. So let's suppose that Kate runs a distance L, that's along this dotted line, while Helen runs a distance L plus 3. We are given the width of each lane, it's 1.2. So let the radius of the inner circle be R, we don't know what it is. Um, so the radius of Kate's path is going to be R plus half the width of the lane, well half of 1.2 is 0.6. Now in blue, I will show the radius of Kate's path. So we want the distance from O to this dotted line here. Well, you see, that's R, which I'm calling this distance, the radius of the inner circle, plus 1.2, plus 0.6. Now we want theta in radians, okay? So what's the definition of an angle in radians? Well, we just take the arc subtended by that angle. So this arc here um, is L. And we divide it by the radius of the arc, okay? So theta in radians is the number of radii that fit into this arc. Okay, and uh, so this arc is called L, and the radius of it is r plus 0.6, so this ratio gives us theta. And that must be the same for the outer arc, this one in blue here. So that arc length is L plus 3, and we divide by the radius of this outer arc, which is r plus 1.8. Okay, so that's just the definition of theta and radians, and we want to work out this ratio, or this ratio. Um, okay, you know, we can't really break this ratio down as it stands, of course, because we don't know what L or R is, but we, we use the fact that these fractions are equal. If two fractions are equal, we can cross-multiply. So from this relation, we could write L in terms of R, or R in terms of L. So I've decided to write R in terms of L. So we need to take all of this thing here, and plug it into one of these two fractions. So I'll use this one because it looks a bit simpler. Okay, so I've just plugged in for R. I've just plugged this thing in here. And as you can see, very fortunately, these two cancel out. So we can actually get a value for theta because the L's will cancel. So we end up at 1 divided by 0 0.4. Um, so this is uh, 10 over 4 which is 5 over 2, or 2.5 radians. Here we have the graph of the voltage of an electric circuit. You can see that it's an alternating voltage. The voltage is given as a function of time by V equals 311 sine 100 pi T. Now we looked at functions of the form A sine KT. We saw that A is the amplitude or maximum height of the function. So in this case, the amplitude or height is 311. This would be 311 volts. So the range of the function is from the minimum value that the function has, which is actually minus 311, to the maximum value, which is plus 311. So we can write the range like this. Now we also saw previously that the period of this function, that is the smallest interval over which this function repeats itself, is given by 2 pi over the coefficient of t. So the coefficient of t here is 100 pi, so if we work this out we get 1 over 50. And uh, this axis is time, and time is in seconds, so the period is uh, 1 50th of a second which is also 0 0.02 seconds. Next we want to find how many complete periods are there in one second. Well, 0 0.02 seconds, or 1 50th of a second, is one period. So how many of these would fit into one second? Well, that's quite easy. If it's 1 50th of a second, well, you know, 50 of these must fit into one second. Or if you're not sure, you know, take one second and divide it by the length of the period, which is 0 0.02 seconds. And uh, that comes to 50. Um, by the way, that's the same thing as inverting this number here. Okay, so, you know, in this solution here, 
we've just inverted the period. We've inverted get get the reciprocal of one over fifty, and that gives us the number of periods in a second. Uh, by the way, that's known as the frequency of the circuit. So basically, the voltage alternates. It does one uh, uh, complete cycle in one fiftieth of a second, or you know, fifty cycles are completed in one second. The table below gives the voltage correct to the nearest whole number at equally spaced intervals from T0 to T12 over one complete period. So for example at time T1 the voltage is 156. So T1 is this time here. So the voltage is just the height of this dashed line. This point here is T6. Okay, T6 is 0 0.01 seconds. And uh, the voltage at that time is 0. Okay, you can see that here in, in the table. So the last time value is T12. Now, what is meant by the standard deviation of a set of values? So we saw this before. We have to calculate the mean of the values x bar. Well, the mean of all the values is just the sum of all the values divided by the total number of values, which is n. So we're summing from i equals 1 up to n. n is 12 in this case. As a matter of fact, we can easily calculate the mean of these 12 values. Um, you can see that if we sum all these values, we'll actually get 0. You see, 156 plus minus 156 is 0, and so on. So all of these values actually sum to 0. So we get 0 divided by 12, which is 0. So, the standard deviation is a measure of the spread of all our values about the mean. So we have to get the sum of the square deviations of each of the values about the mean, from the mean. So, um, xi stands for all the values, okay, and, and we've 1 to 12 of them, we have 12 values. So, for example, if we put 1 in for i, we get x1. So we can say x1 is the first value, let's say it's 156. Uh, so that'd be 156 minus 0 squared, that's the square deviation of 156 from the mean. And the next value, if we put 2 in, it would be x2, let's say 269, minus the mean squared, and so on. And we keep going to the last value, which would be, you know, the 12th value, I say x12, which is 0, and we get its deviation from the mean and square that. So we get the sum of the squares of the deviations of all the values from the mean, and then we get the mean of those square deviations. So we got 12 of them, so we divide by 12. And uh, we take a square root, well, that's because we want to compensate f to some extent for squaring. That's, you know, because we want sigma to come out in units of volts. You know, if we do the squaring, the units become volts squared. Taking the square root converts volts squared to units of volts. Anyway, we can use our calculator to do this calculation. We can just feed in all 12 values and uh, it'll give us the mean and the standard deviation. Well, we know that the mean is zero, but anyway, let's do that. So on this calculator, we have to press button two, and uh, we feed in our list of values. Okay, so I've cleared this column, so all the values just go into this column. So the first value is 156, next value is 269, and we just feed in all the values. Okay, so there we go. I fit in all 12 values. The last value, as you can see, is zero. Now, um, we just press one variable here. Um, you know, that we just have um, a single variable. We're not dealing with plotting, you know, pairs of values. So here we have all the statistics. Um, so we want sigma. Actually, this is the standard deviation for a population. Um, that's the one with n after it, okay? So, in this problem, n is 12. Um, now, there is a, also a standard deviation where we take 1 from the sample. In that case, we would be dividing by 12 minus 1 to get 11. Now, that's a different statistic. That's actually the sample standard deviation. But we're looking for sigma, which is the population standard deviation. So, when, when you want sigma, this is the value you read. So, we get 219.89. So we round that to the nearest whole number, and we get 220 volts. 
The standard deviation sigma of closely spaced values of any function of the form v equals a sine bt over one full period is given by k to sigma equals v max. k is a constant that does not depend on a or b, that's these two values here. v max is the maximum value of the function. Okay, so we want to calculate k for this particular function. So as you can see, this function here has the form a sine bt. All right, so you know we can apply this formula, and of course we we um, divided up our function over one full period. So we saw before that the maximum value of the function is this number here. Well, it, they're calling it a here. I I call it the amplitude earlier. Well, that's three hundred and eleven. So v max is three hundred and eleven, uh, and sigma we just worked out previously. That's two twenty. So this number k is 311 divided by 220, which is approximately 1.414. Now we want to use the answer in part C1 to find the value of b required so that the function v equals a sine bt has 60 complete periods in one second. Okay, so we have a new function now. Um, it has 60 periods in one second. So what does that mean? So it means that if we take, say, one cycle of this new function, one period of it, well, it must be 1 over 60. 1 over 60 of a second, a period. Because if we, you know, multiply this by 60, well, you know, 60 multiplied by 1 over 60 is 1 second. Okay, so if we go all the way out here to uh, 1 second, you know, we would have 60, 60 periods covered. But we also know that the period of a function of this form is given by 2 pi over the coefficient of t. We saw that at the start. Well, I called the function a sine kt. But of course, that's just the same as this, just different notation. Little a instead of big A, little b instead of k. So that's our period, and uh, we can solve now for b. We just uh, cross multiply b times 1 equals 2 pi times 60, which is 120 pi. We will also want the approximate value of a so that the function has a standard deviation of 110 volts. So this is going to be our sigma. So th we saw that v max and sigma were related through this relation here, where k is a constant. So k doesn't change. So if we change v max and sigma, um, k will remain the same. So you know v max equals k multiplied by sigma, and uh, k is a constant. So we take that answer from the previous part, but sigma is now different. Sigma is 110, and if we multiply these, we get v max. But v max is just this thing here, this is just the amplitude, or the maximum value of the function. So we get 156. So now we can actually write down our function, fill in for a and b.